what should each person see? Is it operational? Is it specific? And so those dashboards would then be customized for whoever is running each location. So they can see whatever it is that they're being graded on specifically and then be able to roll that up. And then ultimately, you want to not just compare against yourself, but what are the industry benchmarks that you're trying to compete against? Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at Independent ERP and Digital Transformation Consulting Firm, Elevate IQ. CFOs need a ton of KPIs to ensure profitability, to ensure all revenue and expenses get accounted, to maintain debt to equity ratio to get the favorable terms from bank, to maintain the price of the stock. But doing all of this might require thousands of KPIs. Also, as companies grow, CFOs might not have the bandwidth to keep track of every transaction of the business. So they require KPIs that are not only reliable, but traceable in a manageable manner. So which KPIs are the most critical for CFOs? In today's episode, we invited a panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn who brings significant expertise to discuss the top KPIs for CFOs. We discussed the best KPIs that CFOs should be measuring in several industries, such as manufacturing and healthcare. Finally, we discussed the KPIs that are typically meaningless to measure and might be counterproductive. With that, Let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation. And for today, we have a very exciting topic for our CFOs, which is going to be top KPIs for CFOs. And I don't know if technology is going to cooperate with us today. I am seeing that I'm freezing a little bit. Um, So bear with us. I I don't know if other guys are also noticing that. So no? Okay. So I think we are good. Awesome. So so we are going to start with everybody's intros. And then we are going to jump right into the topic. If you don't know me, I am Sam Gupta, principal Mm -hmm. at Elevate IQ. Elevate IQ is the independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm. On that note, I am going to move to Dave for his intro. Thank you, Sam, and and hello to everyone. Uh, My name is Dave Griffith. I run a company called Kaplan Solutions. Our focus is to help manufacturing and industrial companies run more profitably through a process that that we have and go deliver kind of all over North America. Um, And I would say in that instance, CFOs are some of my best friends and and generally people that I want to talk to. So I'm happy to be able to talk to them uh, today, Sam. So this time it is going to be fun day because typically you are pitching to CFOs and now you have to think from their perspective, telling their Mm -hmm. KPIs that they should be caring about. So thank you so much for being here, Dave. (laughs) Mark, can I move to you next for your intro, if you don't mind? Absolutely. Um, Thanks, Sam. My name is Mark Lilly. I'm president and CEO of Lillyworks. We help manufacturers solve the late problem, which typically revolves around scheduling, material planning, kind of managing production. Um, And in that regard, one of the benefits to managing production better, certainly, is increased uh, revenue generation within a given time period, which translates to better profitability, something I would hope and think that most CFOs would be interested in. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Mark. Uh, Brian, joining for the first time. Can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Happy to. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Brian Boji. I lead the healthcare vertical at Sage Intact. Sage Intact is an accounting and ERP solution. 
and our healthcare organization part of it focus on helps accountants focus on strategic initiatives increase efficiency and drive growth amazing thank you so much for being here brian and typically when dave is going to be here we are typically doing it versus ot which is the manufacturing joke so hopefully we can neutralize that a little bit for today so thank you so much for being here brian pleasure sharon can i ask you to introduce yourself next thank you sam my name is sharon custer and i'm running a financial analysis consulting agency called Inventory Optimization Pro. And uh, we're focusing on helping companies to align their inventory investment to achieve their business goals. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Sharon. And uh, before we start on the topic, if you're in the audience and joining for the first time, Make sure you guys post your questions and comments. Typically, we try to cover them during the show. If we run out of time, we'll make sure that you guys are going to receive your answers. On that note, if you're in the audience, uh, post one comment related to the KPIs that you have for CFOs that is going to be favorite for you. Now, I am going to move to the first question with Dave. And Dave, we are really checking that PLN, uh, PNL perspective. So obviously, mm-hmm. you need to go beyond your shop floor and looking at PNL as well as balance sheet because that's what mm-hmm. CFOs cares for. Obviously, you have to care for other things too. Uh, if they are not going to be in line, your PNL and balance sheet is probably not going to be fun. So from the CFO perspective, some of the top KPIs that you might be able to share, any stories you might you have. Uh, related to the KPIs. Dave, over to you. Yeah, absolutely, Sam. So as I look at top KPIs for CFOs, I kind of look at the entire process. And and as you mentioned, I guess I spend a lot of time dealing with KPIs, and most of them are kind of within the manufacturing floor of the industrial process in and of themselves. And it is a, a rare occasion, but a nice occasion that I get to go look at the entirety of the process within an organization. So, so as, as I was thinking about this, I, I think from the CFO perspective, I probably really care about three things, right? I care that we still have inventory coming in. And on the subset of that, where, where, what does the cost and the quality of that inventory look like compared to historical? Um, in the middle, are we running production and what does that throughput look like? Because if we are running production and we have inventory and we are on target, we're making money. And then the third set, the third major KPI that I'm looking at is, is the output KPI, right? Are we, are we shipping it? And I've dealt with organizations that we ship it, they ship to a distribution center and they still have to hold inventory. I've dealt with uh, organizations that they ship it to a distribution center that they own. And at that point, they get to start charging customers rent for it sitting there. So kind of the, the shipping category really depends upon how the organization works. Uh, but, but in my mind, if I can see kind of like three green dots as the CFO on a uh, on a cell phone screen saying, hey, we're bringing in good quality, correctly priced items. We are running throughput at a rate in which we expect to run and we are shipping throughput at the rate that we were hoping that we were going to ship. We should be making money as an organization. So as I look at kind of the top three KPIs, that that is what I come up with as a high level. And then as I was thinking on it, I I have like a thousand subsets, but that was not the question you asked, Sam. You asked what are the top KPIs a a CFO should look for. And in in my mind, uh, those are the top three. I've dealt with with a number of different CFOs. Uh, So I last year worked worked for a while with a brewery. And the CFO was the most hands-on person I had kind of ever met. He was, in fact, the first person who called and said, hey, we have this problem. Can you come help? And then he was more hands-on involved in process and, and optimizations than, uh, th- than any CFO ever should be. He was, in fact, so involved, it scared everyone a little bit, but but it, it was all a good thing. And so we sat down and we spoke with him kind of a number of times, and he had, a, he had many, many KPIs that he was worried about, not just kind of raw material inventory and throughput, but also as we go kind of look at inventory. And, and I think that it's very easy to get into the weeds on kind of any or all of those. But again, as I look at kind of the top three, th- those, in my opinion, are probably th- the top three to look at. And then you can create eight and almost uh, innumerable number uh, of subcategories below that. 
Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Dave. And uh, I am going to share some perspectives from the last session because there were some really good points from the last session. We'll bring that inside. Last session we did for CEOs. Today we are talking about CFOs. But obviously the topic is similar, right? So one of the things that we discussed is this size, which matters a lot when we look at the KPI. $5 million business, $5 million CFO is going to be very different from $5 billion, okay? Mm -hmm. The responsibilities are going to be very different. The kind of KPIs that you are going to be tracking, very different. Macro versus micro, always different, right? So the KPIs that you mentioned, not sure whether they are macro, micro. I think that distinction is equally relevant as well. Traceability. Traceability is going to be super critical in terms of what am I looking at the macro level and how can I get to the micro level? I'll give you one more background in terms of why this show exists, to be honest, for this year. Okay, we have KPIs pretty much for every single role. One of the things that Mark and Brian is going to correlate and relate with this is because um, I don't know if you all have been involved with the implementation process of ERP. Okay, I know Dave, Sharon, you are probably, you have been users, but when you implement an ERP, you need to create the dashboards pretty much for everybody, including oh the CFOs. So you have just one screen and you can probably have five KPIs. So which one are we looking at for a CFO? So that was the mindset of creating this series. So, so now, uh, Dave, going back to you, the KPIs that you mentioned, do you think that CFOs are going to be cool with the KPIs that you mentioned, or should they be looking at something else than what you mentioned? So uh, I guess as I look um, at most CFOs, my, my goal was to, to look at what three KPIs, like if I've got a, a list of three to five KPIs and I can see three to five kind of green and or yellow and or red dots or numbers or any of those things, percentages, what three would in at least the vast majority of industrial and manufacturing facilities that I typically work at, what are good KPIs that would allow people to say, yes, we are running well or no, we're not running well kind of in instantaneously from a profit and loss perspective. And then I would say beyond those three, I would imagine that that organization has uh, a series of initiatives or a series of other issues that they have. I would probably spend the other two of those five on very particular things that are important to the, the PNL or are important to the CFO's bonus or, or any sort of those uh, series of combinations. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. Really appreciate it. Uh, so, Mark, coming over to you, and I'm pretty sure you have probably done what now, 500 implementations that probably you have been part of. So, obviously, you have seen it all, right? So, now, let's say if you have to design the dashboard for a CFO, what are we showing them? Mark, over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sam. I, you know, I think Dave had it right on. I mean, the, the big ones are uh, inventory, throughput, and, and you know, the, the output part. But I think, in particular, the, you know, what the CFO is doing, yes, looking at the P&L, and and then you know drilling down because the the other folks the, the stakeholders of the company are coming to to him or her and go, going you know what's what's with this number how come it went you know down or up depending upon what it is which number we're looking at you know from period to period and what's going on so they they want to be able to drill down and find find the facts behind that as well and what I find from pre implementation to post implementation is just a tremendous difference in the level of visibility of, of being able to get answers when you drill down, right? So um, oftentimes folks start out where really inventory is a, is a monthly number and they have no clue what their inventory looks like uh, except at, at the end of the month, maybe several days after the end of the month where they've done either a cycle count or physical and they've you know subtracted the beginning inventory and that, you know, from the end and that sort of thing to get to get their number post and post a good ERP implementation, they're going to have not only are they going to have uh, inventory value numbers on on demand, really, on a daily basis if they wanted to, but also the WIP inventory. And that's and that's a big one, too. And that's that's one where we see a lot of folks, um, you know, again, just just not able to drill down or understand how much is in WIP at any one time. Or, or what that's comprised of, whether it's a, a material increase that happened by late, you know, because there are components of WIP. You get your material, your overhead, your outside services. Are we paying too much for those? Or are folks making decisions to send things out too often? So our, our costs are bloated that way. So for me, it's come back to the level of visibility a CFO has 
underneath those KPIs when they when they drill down into them. Okay, very interesting commentary there. So I'll share some stories from my perspective and you guys can challenge me if you like, okay? So when I talk to the CFOs, obviously some CFOs are very operational the way they think, the way they, they work, okay? But the other CFOs, okay, especially the ones that are going to be dealing at the enterprise level, they understand general ledger. They look from that perspective. Sometimes they are not even going to have any insights into operations because it's going to be a completely different system. They don't even go there. Okay. It starts with the GL and, you know, anything uh, after they are going to have the visibility into the process. And sometimes they are probably not going to have the traceability either. So, Mark, over to you. I mean, do you have any sort of clarifications there? Any other insights? Do you agree, disagree with me? I, I agree, certainly. And again, if they have, um, but they're still going to want to understand where the numbers are coming from, where the increases or decreases are coming from. Now, if they're if they're limited in their scope of, of whether it's their role or the information that's available to them, or maybe they're not a manufacturer at all, maybe they're a distributor or something else, then sure, just, just getting into the details of the accounting numbers is going to help them. So a sales number, for example, where did that come from? How how many orders did we get? What's the nature of the orders? Are they do we get fewer orders but they were bigger? Did we get more and they were smaller? Those those types of things they may be interested in to see what's trending. So maybe not operational from a from a manufacturing perspective, but op, the operational information from a business process standpoint. I think there's still most CFOs are pretty savvy in that. And, and they're still going to want to see uh, the, the detail that's that's underneath those things. Okay, amazing insights there, Mark. Thank you so much. So, Brian, coming over to you, and these guys are talking about inventory coming in, inventory going out. And if you talk about verticals such as healthcare, there is no inventory coming in. Maybe there is some, but not a lot, right? So the KPIs are probably going to be very different. So from your perspective, Brian, when you think of designing this dashboard for CFOs, the top KPIs that they should be looking at. What are we thinking here in your space, Brian? So it's really interesting, and I love the conversation, and I think you guys are spot on in the way you're describing it. But I think you'd be surprised because healthcare does have a lot of the manufacturing components or the delivery. Yeah. So you just think of the inventory as the caregivers and the output being the care. So when we talk to CFOs and work with them in designing their dashboards, what's really important to them is understanding what that workflow is and what that value is, and from both an operational and uh, an organizational level. And they really need not just to understand what happened, but be able to predict what's going to happen, because I think the CFO job has changed considerably. So what I mean by that, so revenues under the KPI dashboard would be revenue per caregiver, revenue per location, revenue per procedure. So they understand what the makeup is, how profitable are each of the caregivers, what types of care are they giving, what procedure code would they be using? In other words, a code for a broken arm or a broken leg, et cetera. And what's really was interesting over the course of the pandemic, a lot of procedures weren't able to be done. So anything that was an elective procedure or something that wasn't medically necessary at the moment, those things went away. And COVID-19 care was billed at a much less rate. So by having that understanding of what the capacity is per caregiver, where they're spending their time, how much money is being received based on that care, and what they can predict that out based on the, the way the pandemic has gone, we've been able to use that both from a positive perspective of predicting or staffing at the right levels. And from a negative perspective is to understand where that business is and where we have to cut back and maybe additional items need to be added. So more ED capacity versus more plas less plastic surgery, things like that. So understanding that first look, how are we operating? Is, is what we're doing profitable? And where are we seeing our patients come from and how we're treating them? would all be on that top of revenue KPI piece. So this is very interesting. And I believe we have not covered healthcare a lot. So obviously, these are fresh insights for our listeners. And from my experience in healthcare, Brian, the healthcare is going to have many different business models. So I believe you were talking about here, maybe practices, I don't know, hospitals probably. But then inside the healthcare space, you are going to have the life sciences companies. I don't know if you consider them as part of 
the healthcare ecosystem or not. So you have the medical device, you have pharma, you have the hospitals, you have payer providers, healthcare insurance companies. So those all are going to have many different business models and they all are probably going to have different KPIs that CFOs need to be tracking. So do you want to add any more colors there in terms of, you know, which vertical you were talking about? And if you cover the other uh, verticals as well and what KPIs are going to be different in those verticals, Brian? So traditionally, what we cover is on the provider side, meaning anybody that provides care. So that can be hospitals, that can be uh, labs, um, dentists, veterinary, mental health, all of those things. But it all kind of plays into the ecosystem. So understanding what types of procedures are happening or having that data from affiliate hospitals. So if you're not doing a lot of um, colonoscopies, then you're not going to need the equipment. You're not going to need the um, it supplies, things like that. So a lot of it goes into that. It's a very interrelated ecosystem. They're going to want to know other things. They're going to want to look at how do we reduce costs if those uh, procedures aren't happening? What types of procedures are happening? Where are they happening? What do those referrals look like? And what are our relationships with those other organizations? It could be uh, on drug pricing or drug usage. How often are our drugs being prescribed in a particular location or area or for what seasonality? There's a whole lot that goes into that, but having that, that type of information on multiple on a dashboard from multiple uh, inputs is what's going to be really important. So this is very interesting. And I think I'm actually going to come back to you in understanding how the SNOP process works, because the way you are describing it, it becomes very interesting because now you are sort of trying to forecast the procedures. That's even more interesting. So I'll come back to you on that. But Sharon, coming over to you, I know you do a lot of work uh, in sort of the uh, space where you are going to be beyond your ERP boundaries and you talk a lot about the transportation, the TMS component uh, overall from the freight perspective, as well as a little bit of uh, custom brokerage. So overall, from your perspective, let's say if you look at the top KPIs for the CFOs, I don't know if you are going to layer in that insight into the CFOs KPIs, uh, but we are looking for top KPIs for CFOs. Sharon, over to you. Um, thank you, Sam. Um there are levels of different KVIs. Yes. So the more operational, the more detail it goes. But right now we're talking about the top higher level. Now, when you select KVI, you gotta think about what your company's doing. Like what's the mission? Yes. You know, are you are you driving for quality excellency or are you driving for cost effective or what are you doing? So as a support role that we need to set a KVI that be meaningful, meaningful to support the mission of the company, okay? And the KBI will have that measurement to know if it's improvement or, or it's not improvement, you know, it's positive or negative impact on your, you know, situation. For example, I always look at the KPI as like a thermometer. Like I say, right now, the thermometer says that it's a, three degrees Celsius or 37 degrees Fahrenheit. It is cold for a human in the room, right? It is cold. But for the butcher, three Celsius or 37 Fahrenheit is not cold. It's not even freezing. So it's not good for the meat. So it's the purpose. What that KPI really tell you in that situation? Is it good or bad? Is that hit your target or not? It, just think about that KPI. The number is neutral, but what does that really impact you? What, where are you going? That's the whole point. Now, a CFO, there are many, you know, responsibility for CFO. But what I see as inventory optimization, I help CFO to know their return on investment, their business and li liquidity their forecast, their scenario planning. So simply, if you want me to say the top three KPI for CFO, I would say compare your actual with your budget or uh, actual with your forecast, that's one KPI. The number two is cash conversion cycle. What you put it in, what is put it out, like how long it takes you to invest your cash and then get the money out. The third one is very important that is the cash 
flow matching with your inventory replenishment. Yeah. When you buy your inventory, you want to have that resource to buy the inventory instead of keep borrowing. Yeah, that's my two cents. Okay, so very interesting. I think the last part, uh, you know, I really appreciate it because obviously those are the real KPIs that probably CFOs are going to care for. And I believe you mentioned return on investment, the cash conversion cycle, uh, you know, the matching of inventory to uh, to cash, I guess, you know, you mentioned that as well. So that's really good. Now, the question I'm going to have for you is, okay, initially you mentioned the meet temperature. So now why my CFO is caring about the meat temperature, do they need to care about? Or is there going to be any correlation? Are these KPIs that you mentioned toward the end, are they going to be related to these operational KPIs? Operational people know in their head that they matter, but CFOs, I'm not too sure if they really can connect the dots uh, with the operations always. Sharon, over to you. Any thoughts, comments? For, for this, I, I want to have a real life experience or example that, um, it's an e-commerce store. Like they have a strong correlation. Keep thinking the strong correlation is keep putting out money to to uh, to spend money on advertisement, a paid advertisement yeah. when the sales goes down. What I'm saying is that you you need to look at the correlation at the time if that really relevant to your business because each KPI really have correlation. Uh, to impact your sales. If this is your low season, you know that that's from historical data and advertisement, especially paid advertisement, we're not talking about affiliate. Yeah. It's a fixed cost that you don't know the return. And that is not a good idea to spend such huge amount, like a really out of proportion amount of advertisement expenses to, to think that you will increase your sales. So we cannot against the nature, you know, the flow of the the industry, I guess. But uh, you have to have a sense like which KPI you're pulling a look at, it, how strong that correlation that you're looking for at the moment of the situation. Okay, could not agree. But go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um. I to to Sharon's point, I I think um the CFOs, I mean, they're they're smart people, Sam, and they're not living in a bubble. And they 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 need if if they're working in a in a company that's w whatever the nature of their business is whether it's the healthcare processes or distribution and e-commerce processes manufacturing they need to understand what's what's buttering their bread right what what are those processes that are generating that for example I um we had a customer that that had a a, a twelve a twelve week lead time on this on a series of products. And they dug in and, and found, you know, and they, hundreds of parts go into these products, a fairly complex manu bill of, of manufacture. And what they found, to, to Sharon's point, is they, they went in and looked, you know, first off, could they afford to make to stock certain strategic subcomponents to that so that they were able to reduce their lead time dramatically, went from like 12 weeks down to three or four weeks because they look to see do they have the funding could were they would they be able to support the, the 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 stocking the holding of inventory of these key components that would shrink their lead time which is then related to the cash flow and then increase the overall health of the company very quick yeah could not agree more mark i mean operations matter i'm i'm not telling that but i mean you know i don't know how many cfos really think through all the variables that drive the macro kpis go ahead dave i was going to say i think everyone has made really good points and sam i think you made a really good point when you talk about what size of the organization it is right so i think a lot of the kpis that we've talked about are for organizations that there is one group or one facility or maybe even five or ten facilities at, at the point that you get to a, a fortune 50 or a fortune 5000 you know most of these companies have so many facilities underneath the, the actual CFO that each of the locations themselves are worried about some of the individual locations. Maybe they're looking at some of the, hey, can we afford to stock this as, as per Mark's, uh, Mark's comment. And so I think it's really important as you deal with this, as you deal with the financial person at any level, but the CFO to understand 
what is important to again what, what is important to them and what type of organization hey and, and what, what type of organization they are and the the larger the company the less the more to, uh, kind of to sharon's points of you know uh cash convergence and cash flow are, are they going to look at it the overarching conversation and then then maybe there's there's a subset of dashboards in which they're looking at divisions and you know how are each divisions doing but when w- the higher you get and because you've only given us five KPIs that we can possibly put on the dashboard. <laughs> See, Sam, I think the real issue we need to talk about is why can't our ERP people give us 5,000 KPIs oh, that we can God. put on the dashboard? <laughs> it'd be it's real design. small. Sorry, go ahead, Brian, go ahead. I said it'd be real small print. But real I think, small print. <laughs> I think Dave makes an excellent point, and, and Tim, you've talked about this as well, the size of the organization and the scale, right? So you want to be able to measure not only what you're doing in one location, but how does that compare to the other locations? What are the key things that you wanna look at and why? And you wanna be able to dynamically allocate fixed costs. So if there's a management company overseeing it all, they're certainly charging for their services and whatever services they're charging for, they're not eating that cost, but it needs to be allocated across all of those other locations as well. So when you think about it, how do you dynamically allocate all of those expenses for overhead? Could be accounting, could be finance, could be marketing, whatever the case may be. And then you want to be able to understand how they perform not just against themselves or their own benchmarks, but against each other. And then filter that information through. I think a great part of the conversation that you've had is what should each person see? Is it operational? Is it specific? And so those dashboards would then be customized for whoever is running each location so they can see whatever it is that they're being graded on specifically and then be able to roll that up. And then ultimately, you want to not just compare against yourself, but what are the industry benchmarks that you're trying to compete against? Because I look at it and my goal was 10 percent growth. That's great. But if everybody else has grown at 60%, I did a pretty terrible job. Amazing insight, Dave. Thank you so much, Brian. And Dave, I'm not letting you implement the ERP, man. 5,000 KPIs? Are you kidding me? We are trying to make ERP simple here. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad there's at least one person trying to make ERP simple, Sam. That, 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 is, that is the new Elevate IQ tagline. Elevate IQ, we're no longer the independent source for, uh, for ERPs. Simplified Elevate IQ. Source. Yes, yes, your simplified source. Maybe that's the new tagline you guys need, Sam. Awesome, guys. So the next segment that I'm going to open up is going to be really interesting, okay? And these are going to be the KPIs, the worst KPIs that you guys have seen. And typically, there are going to be stories around that, okay? Some of them could get real funny in my experience, okay? So the KPIs that you have seen, those were really terrible. They didn't make any sense. And if you <laughs> if you have any stories around that, you know, we can cover that. So Dave, I'm going to start with you. Number one, examples of KPIs. Obviously, if you have any other comments or comments or any stories, that's the next segment. Uh, over to you, Dave. Uh, absolutely. So I actually want to want to talk on, on one particular story of, of a KPI. I, I hadn't necessarily intended to do this, but Mark brought up WIP and, and work in progress. And so so Mark and I have had many conversations over over WIP um, in the last year or year and a half. But I I worked with I, I looked at a, I looked at an opportunity. I have to kind of anonymize this because I feel like you could get very specific and everyone could figure out who this is. So so I worked with uh, worked with an organization in New England. Uh, to to go look at an, an opportunity and they had copper right so, so they did a bunch of stuff with copper copper in the last year got very expensive and then it got less expensive and of course they bought at the peak and were sitting on a whole bunch of very expensive copper that they couldn't sell right so that their copper copper was like 65 percent of the cost of, of their their normal assembly and, and to Mark's comment of assemblies and sub assemblies w- when I went to have the initial conversation with them you know w- one of the questions I have is, you know, how much whip are you carrying? Because that that is a good possibility to go kind of free up operating cash by just reducing work work in progress. And they came back with a 
unrealistically low number, right? They came back with like one or 2%. And I'm like, I, I can't imagine that you guys are having these problems. And so after a little bit of digging in, it was discovered that uh, this state at least allegedly allows you to create sub-assemblies. And if you call it like an incomplete sub-assembly, you aren't taxed on that, but you are taxed on work in progress. So th they had th this whole other KPI, you know, this whole other section, which was about... 10 times the, the their whip, their work in progress, just kind of the, these sub-assemblies sitting over there. So when you look at it, you're like, oh, you guys actually do have the work in progress that you're looking at. But I don't know how much it was intentional versus how much of financial ramifications of, hey, we got to go build these into these incomplete or these complete sub-assemblies in order to allow us to not pay taxes of holding it on our shelves. And so that is probably the, the strangest and potentially worst uh, KPI th that I have ever run across uh, in, in real life. Okay, so very interesting story there. And I don't know, I mean, see, I'm probably going to ask somebody to translate that for our CFOs who are not going to have as much manufacturing background because I don't know uh, if they are able to follow along. So I don't know, Dave, if you want to attempt or somebody else want to attempt, retranslate that for a CFO who might not have as deep manufacturing background or whip background. Sure. Um, so th th there were specific fin financial and tax ramifications for having work in progress. Uh, so uh, you, you take the inventory out, you, you, you start working on it, and it's in between two machines or two cells. That, that is work in progress. Uh, th this particular state taxed that work in progress. In order to get around that, they had to turn it into a quote unquote sub assembly. So they had to put a couple of pieces of those work in progress in place. And then I think they actually pulled them off the line and put them on shelves or at least digitally. They pulled them off. They, they, they put them on a shelf somewhere. So they were able to not pay the tax ramifications by uh, by not having it as quote unquote work in progress. But also because of this. No one within their facility understood that they had something like 20 times the work in progress that they thought they actually had because they were attempting and, and succeeding at not paying taxes. They were also succeeding at confusing their, their entire system and, and significantly reducing the, the throughput and how quickly they were able to create a final product. And the reason why I am laughing here, Dave, because I can relate with the story and I know it gets really complicated because these taxation rules that you are talking about, they vary per state. Uh, yes. Each state is going to have their own rules in terms of what is taxable, what is not taxable. And not many companies, especially the smaller ones, they don't really do a good job of tracking that. Uh, obviously, if you have a decent ERP system, then probably it can do a lot of that heavy lifting for you. Uh, but not everybody has either the ERP system or it's going to be connected so you lose that insight so thank you so much dave for that so mark i'm coming over to you any terrible kpis that you have seen in your experience that cfos probably should not be tracking and any comments over comments any stories mark over to you sure yeah um kind of the um the the one i'm going to choose is fairly controversial <laughs> and uh, um although it is uh it's a it's a story that literally has a, a book behind it one of my favorite books um, from a from a uh, professional standpoint, that's called the Measurement Nightmare by Deborah Smith, um, and it's about uh, essentially throughput costing, contribution margin costing, and what uh, what Deborah describes is she doesn't actually give the company name. I I think it was International Harvester, but I'm not exactly I'm not 100% sure. Um, and I think there are other books are, are, are that that write about the demise of International Harvester, and it was primarily due to this high level manager um, who was the CFO level type and decided that he was going to look at the unit cost of each of their products. Okay. Now, as we know, the unit cost is comprised of material, labor, uh, any outside services and overhead, right? So now we get back to that allocation of overhead. And, and that's really the, the gist of it is that the the, the allocation of the overhead is fairly random when it comes to being applied to the cost. So so this person sorted all the, the unit costs um, based on that and said, OK, which which is my highest cost item right, compared to the uh, the sale price? 
and said, we, we need to outsource that. And just went down the list. We need to outsource that. Okay, we, we can get it cheaper if we buy it from someone else, right? When you're looking at the overall cost. And of course, instead of looking at the contribution margin of each of those products, which does actually reflect what sort of level of, of profitability that product is contributing to the to the organization, right? That's the much clearer picture in that regard. Um, instead of doing that, they they basically um, drove the company down in in into close to bankruptcy by uh, by by doing those sort of acts. Yeah, I could not agree more. And I guess, you know, I have seen similar scenarios as well. I think I shared this story last time too, that sometimes people are over measuring uh, and they need to figure out the uh, cost of measurement as well. But then measuring that cost could require a lot of cost as well. <laughs> so that it could get really, really ugly. So thank you so much, Mark, for that story. Any other follow-up comments? Any, any, any other comments, Mark, before I move on to Brian? Sure. So just a, a little bit of interesting clarification on that is when you um, when you look at profit. So what we often find and and I apologize, I'm, I'm back in manufacturing, but what a lot of folks want to do is they want to look at the profitability of jobs. Right. And when you're using unit cost compared to the you know that has the, the labor and overhead components in it and compare that to the revenue price, when you when you add up the profitability of all the jobs right that that's not going because of the way overhead is kind of randomly being allocated that's not going to equal your overall profitability of the company now on the flip side if you use a contribution margin approach in other words revenue of the job right the the actual amount that job is contributing that somebody's paying for it right um minus the material and uh, and any outside the variable costs for it then you get a throughput value and that and that throughput value when you add those all up across the jobs that does equal your overall throughput of the organization and then you subtract what is generally a fixed cost and that's the other fallacy with unit cost is generally labor and overhead are, are fixed do they vary a little bit month to month sure but generally it's a fixed cost and when you subtract that from the overall contribution margin then you get your, your profitability number yeah could not agree more thank you so much uh, mark for that and brian if i gave these guys a choice whether they would like to watch a manufacturing show or Trevor Noah, I can almost guarantee that they are going to choose manufacturing. So these guys are so passionate about manufacturing. Now, switching back to healthcare, right? So, or any other industries that you may have examples of. So in your industry, I think it's very unique and interesting. I think you were talking about some of the things that you guys have to do in terms of forecasting those procedures. Uh, you know, I don't know who want to do that, to be honest. And I don't know how comfortable that experience is going to be. <laughs> but you have to do that if you have to do your inventory planning. Talk about the job, right? So in your space, in my experience, uh, some of the things compliance reporting is, is going to be probably critical. And that is going to drive a lot of things. So I don't know if that helps in with the discipline a little bit. Uh, because obviously the reporting is going to require a lot of things. So you are not probably going to have as much flexibility in terms of what you can do from your planning process. So I don't know if I'm making sense here, uh, but, you know, over to you, any sort of worst, when you think about worst KPI, so I don't know how worse they are going to get in your space because you don't have <laughs> as much room, I guess, to play around with KPIs. Brian, over to you. So I love Dave and Mark's examples. And seriously, this is going to fit right into healthcare and you'll immediately say, wow, the similarities are, are absolutely there. So we worked with a dental, surgical dental group. Yeah. And they had a dental surgeon and he was billing ridiculous amounts of money. And by billing, I mean, the dentist would go in and perform a procedure and then they would bill either the patient or Medicare, Medicaid, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, whatever. That's the billings part of it. And they thought, this person is a complete rock star. We have to do everything we can for this person. Yeah. Then they started adding to that KPI per Mark's example, right? So this was revenue per billing. And they looked at how much does the dentist's salary 
How much are the surgical kits? How much is the OR rental? How much are the two surgical nurses? And they found that every time you stepped into an OR, they lost money. So that's one way to look at it. It's very similar to the examples of you're only measuring a part of it. So they were only measuring billings. They weren't measuring profitability per caregiver. And because of that, they only saw part of the picture. So it's being able, so it's any of those KPIs, whether it's revenue per caregiver or patient per day or those kind of things that really end up taking you down the wrong path, as Mark said. And what you realize when you look at the whole picture, you could do it through activity-based costing, you could do it through any manner. But that understanding of the true health of the organization is really where you need to be. Otherwise, you make assumptions based on faulty data. So very interesting insights and, and the story there, okay? And I am going to touch a little bit back uh, in terms of the compliance. So my understanding is that, and I don't know how this guy was a rock star, to be honest, because there are reporting requirements, okay? Uh, <laughs> because you are supposed to be reporting how much you are billing, and you also need to report if anybody is offering any sort of meals or whatever. I don't know if that is also applicable to dentists, but for the caregivers, they definitely need to report. That's my understanding, at least. And you can correct me if I'm off here. So if that is going to be the requirement, can they still bill that high? Wouldn't there be any requirement from the compliance perspective, Brian? So each each individual provider sets a contract okay. with the insurance company. And those are wildly different. So my contract to provide a dental service with Blue Cross Blue Shield with United, with Medicare or Medicaid, they can all be ridiculously different numbers. You know, a tooth extraction could cost $1,000 with one, $10,000 with another, and there are lots of different ways that you can look at that. So when they go into that data, they know if I am doing a tooth extraction through, and your personal insurance is Blue Cross Blue Shield, I'm going to get $10,000. But if your insurance is united, I'm only going to get $5,000. Hmm. And if it's Medicare, I'm going to get 1000 So not only are you looking at what the billing rate is in general, but then you have to look at it by who's reimbursing you that money and who's on the hook for that. And all of those contracts are different. And all of those contracts are controversial, uh, uh, confidential. So you cannot find out how much each of those contracts is. It's a confidentiality clause written into those contracts. So they not only have to understand what they did, but who they did it for to get to that number. Very interesting. Thank you so much, Brian, for those insights. And Sharon, uh, you know, coming over to you. So these guys are talking about real disconnect between the KPIs. And I think you guys, uh, you know, mentioned this before as well. And I was talking about, okay, who cares for operations that stay in the GL, right? And you are probably going to be good, but it doesn't work that way because KPIs, they need to be traceable. They need to be connected. And, you know, if you are going to have any problems from the data perspective, obviously you are not going to see that in your macro KPIs. So we are talking about the funny KPIs, any useless KPIs, uh, any sort of terrible KPIs. Sharon, whatever you have seen in your experience, over to you. I, I would say, instead of saying what are the worst three KPIs, I would say um, the connection between the KPIs or how to put it, it's like CFO usually would look at the KPIs is the end result. It's, it's already happened, happened, like the gross profit, gross margin or, um, you know, anything that all the KPIs that usually said it is, is a, is the fact in the past. Now, what I'm trying to say is that uh, there's two things. Each layer in the organization, the KPI need to support each level. So it's not like you said your KPI, I do my thing, and there is nobody connect to anybody. That's number one. Number two is that instead of always only look at the lag factor or lag KPI that has already happened in the past, um, the organization needs to set some KPI that actually help to improve the lag KPI. For example, say if my inventory shrinkage is a problem, 
meaning like things are missing, things are broken, you know, or things are just not add up. But every month I just look at that KPI, okay, shrinkage 2%, 5%, 10%. Okay, today's 10%, I want to reduce to 2%. But you always look at the numbers at 10, 5, 8, it doesn't mean anything. It just randomly happened. OK, but if you really want to improve your organization, you need to put some lead KPI in the place to improve the actual end result. For example, if inventory shrinkage is the problem, maybe you need to have a more frequent um, cycle counting, you know, like a, a, instead of counting every year, maybe you need to start counting your physical inventory every month or even every two weeks, something like that. And it's a little bit extreme, but I'm just saying like you need to have some actions that really improve the end result. Yeah, so very interesting insights here. So I am going to ask you one question and I don't know if this is going to be a CFO's responsibility or somebody else's responsibility, but we are always, always going to have organizational silos, okay? Nobody's breaking them, okay? So, <laughs> and if you are going to have them, then obviously the KPIs are going to be all over the place in general. So should it be the responsibility of the CFO to sort of break down those organizational silos so that you can get the traceability? Because if you cannot talk to those guys, what they are doing, you don't know what is happening with those KPIs. What you are going to get finally may not be what may be the real story inside those four walls. <laughs> so uh, Sharon, in your experience, whose responsibility is it to break down those organizational silos so that you have the real insight uh, coming at the macro level? I would say it's a cooperation among all the departments. So the CFO has to be very clear what he wants, you know, and, and, and then communication is the key. It's like, hey, I'm gonna set this KPI for the sales department. I'm gonna set this KPI for the inventory department. And this are why, the, why those KPIs support your goal as a, for CFO. Um, I think that's the key. It's impossible for CFO to do everything or see everything, you know. Um, yeah. Okay. Amazing insights there. Um, so I guess we have 10 minutes. We can probably do one more round and then we'll open up for the closing advice and we'll take short closing advice. So Dave, we'll just do uh, comments over comments or a story, I guess, uh, if you guys have any. Absolutely. So I think uh, that both Sharon and Brian made some really good points. So I think Sharon's point on leading versus lagging KPIs are really important. Uh, having both leading and lagging KPIs uh, are important because you want to not only assess previously what has happened, but also the, the health. And if you're the CEO, CFO of an organization, you should be intimately involved in understanding, especially the, the cash flow ramifications of what the health of that looks like. And I think Brian made a really good point of kind of combination numbers, right? So it's not just uh, a straight throughput number, right? It's probably a, hey, I want to go take a look at, you know, what we're doing versus what it ex what is expected. I would like to know how much it costs versus normal raw materials. And then I would like to know what, that forward looking number that that's sales, right? So how many, what sales do we have booked? Or in Brian's case, I suppose, how many patients do we have booked? Maybe patients booked for, for what particular procedures or patients booked against expected procedures. And I would like to know that we are generally on track, right? So in Brian's instance, if we know the patients, if we know the expected procedures, are we are are our forecasts generally in line with what we expect? And I would imagine almost every CFO is going to want to know that because the, I work with very few groups who get to make the same thing all day. Uh, yeah, I, I work with very few groups who make the same thing all day, every day, because what, what fun would that be, Sam? Uh, and then as I look at uh, kind of some of the worst KPIs, uh, I, I guess kind of the, the two big ones that we, we didn't necessarily talk about and kind of I, I made the joke on one is Sam why can't we have 5,000 KPIs it, it's trying to measure everything right so if, if anyone is still listening and didn't realize I was joking when I said Sam why can't we measure 5,000 things you don't want to measure everything most of the people who I know who say hey I want to measure everything just have no idea of what we want to measure and honestly, I hope it's not the CFO that tells me that. I've had a couple of CFOs tell me that we want to measure everything, and that that led into a very long conversation of what are good KPIs and and very much around this. And and then, kind of on the flip side, is is the people that want to measure nothing, right? If not, if the the only thing 
potentially worse than trying to measure everything is trying to measure nothing, right? If you don't have that clean dashboard with, with five KPIs of whatever is important, some leading, some lagging, some combination of, of complex, uh, you know, numbers and a bunch of different things, then you also probably need to go seek help. But I can't imagine any CFOs are going to be in that point, right? CFOs generally know what is important financially to an organization, or at least I hope know what is important financially to an organization. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. Mark, any comments over comments, jokes over jokes, stories over stories? Yeah. <laughs> well, for, first off, I just wanted to say over the uh, over measuring, you know, what oftentimes, right, what what gets measured improves, right? But what what also often happens is when you know, it, if if you go out and start doing time studies, for example, you know, you're, you're, the times are going to be a lot quicker than when somebody's not there with a stopwatch doing the time study. So, so there's kind of both effects there. With with a accounting and measuring um, measuring business performance with with accounting, you can you can often say, and and I think we've we've kind of talked about this. A lot of a lot of this is historical, you know. So. Oftentimes, this is all the information that that you have. So, you know, setting strategy and moving the company forward with just the accounting numbers tends to be like, you know, driving a boat by looking backwards at the wake, right, and, instead of forward. So, um, and I think Brian mentioned, Sharon touched on it too. I think is the what about the future looking, the the predictability, right? And and that's really powerful if you can. If you can, if you have, you can come up with a model that's believable. And that's, that's really the key around the model, something that's believable that will project into the future and see that. Now, now one of the things that, that I've, uh, I've learned over the past few years is especially with uh, inventory management, for example, if you have a model, a, a different replenishment model, for example, you want to test that. Or even with um, forecasting is another one. If you have a forecasting model and you want to test that. Well, get, you know, a certain period of data, let's say two years of data, and then go backwards a year, right? Pretend you're a year back using, you know, year minus two as your, as your, your, your history, and then execute that model, see what it comes up with, and compare it to what actually happened, right? So, it, so then you can see, hey, that, that model is going to work. In fact, I, I remember doing something with uh, something called focus forecasting years ago as a as a student, I think. And it, it kind of did that. It, it actually compared three models and whichever one worked the best, right, whichever one was close to that reality, the, their future reality was was the one we're going to. All right, let's pick that. And now we're, we'll apply it in current time. OK, amazing. Thank you so much, Mark, for that. Brian, any comments over comments, jokes over jokes, stories over stories? So, Dave, I think you've got a career in healthcare finance if you ever want one. You did a great job explaining that. Fantastic. And Sharon, I totally agree with what you're saying about the silos. So one of the things that are starting to come down is that sharing of data. Because as Mark, Dave, and Sharon all talked about was the ability to understand not just what's in your silo, but outside. You know, we call it the four legs of the stool for healthcare. You have to understand the clinical, the financial, the statistical, and the regulatory. And unless you can do that, then you're you're going to be in trouble. So, you know, being able to integrate that data directly into your feed, and you can do it through statistical accounts, is a great, or even just GL, you know, inputs, is a great way to really understand how that looks and and what the true health of your organization is. So, I think that's where to the comment that Mark made on the future, right? That's really where we have to start thinking because it's not just enough to report on what happened. You now have a seat as a CFO at the table on the planning committee to understand where should my next factory go based on social determinants of health or things like that, or what procedures should we offer here or what things should we stop doing in a location? And those are all the key insights that you're gonna to need to be successful. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Brian, for that. Uh, Sharon, any comments over comments, jokes over jokes, stories over stories? Thank you, Sam. Um, I would like to say um, being a human in a way that the CFO are humans too. And I would say when you stand on the top, you will feel like you are afraid of missing out, fear of missing out. So you want a thousand, five thousand 
KPI on your dashboard, like Dev said. And Brian mentioned, like, you know, you're completely, uh, how do I, you read the data completely one sided and then you're missing out the other side. Uh, it, it, it totally possibly happened, but what I'm saying is that we need to understand the meaning of the KPI, what does that really do to your organization? Yeah. That number shows on your dashboard, what does that really mean compared to last month or three months ago or a year ago? Right now at this moment, what does that really mean? And then you dig into the detail when you find something is not logical. So you, you kind of peel the layer of onions to find the root cause. So without seeing 5,000 KPI in the dashboard, <laughs> and you're not missing out anything. Yeah. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, so we have roughly one minute, so I'm going to pick two people for the closing advice. Dave, I'll start with you. Super short clo closing advice. Fantastic. I would say pick a appropriately small number of leading and lagging KPIs, and don't be afraid to go change them as you change as an organization. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, we can probably accommodate for Mark. Closing advice, super short. <laughs> sure. So um, uh, take a look at, at the different models. Um, test those models with past history and pick model, whether it's inventory, revenue generation, production. Uh, find a model that fits you. Thank you so much, Mark. Really appreciate it. Brian, closing advice, super short, please. Look at all of the factors that go into whatever it is, the product that you're creating, both internal and external, to be able to make decisions on what's the most profitable. Thank you so much, Brian. Sharon, closing advice, please. Super short. Very simple. Know your lead KPI and lag KPI. And that's this two work, work to each other. So pick the ones that is super important to you. Awesome, guys. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another topic. On that note, thanks, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Thanks, all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing their knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests, and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Dave Griffith, head over to dave-griffith.com. It's d-a-v-e-g-r-i-f-f-i-t-h.com. If you want to learn more about Mark Lilly, head over to lillyworks.com. L-I-L-L-Y-W-O-R-K-S.com. If you want to learn more about Sharon Custer, head over to inventoryoptimization.pro. It's I-N-V-E-N-T-O-R-Y O-P-T-I-M-I Z-A-T-I-O-N dot pro. If you want to learn more about Brian Bogey, head over to sage.com. It's S-A-G-E dot com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Narav Shah, who shares his insights into the process challenges of make-to-order manufacturers. Also, the interview with Megan Gamble, who shares her insights into building the systems for the packaging industry. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you, and I hope to catch you on the next episode Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.